Hello and welcome to a special edition of Asia Today from Washington. I'm Richard Lister with one of a series of newsmaker profiles that we do at this time every year. Uh, my guest today has been from the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon to the illegal drinking dens of Iran to speak to the people he believes could be the saviors of the Middle East, not its politicians, but its younger generation. Jared Cohen wrote about his experiences in his book, Children of Jihad. He now works for the US State Department as uh, part of the policy planning team, although he's speaking today in a purely personal capacity. Uh, Jared, thanks for joining us. Um, let me ask you first, when you set out on this quest to speak to the young people of the Middle East, as a Jewish American yourself, what did you expect to find? Well, Richard, it's, it's really interesting. I'm a Jewish kid from a, a small town in, in, in Connecticut of about 9,000 people. And initially, I went to the Middle East not to interview the youth, but to interview the opposition, uh, who I thought were uh, political dissidents and, and, and reformers and you know, moderate religious leaders and, 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 and journalists. And, and you know, it's difficult in, in some of these countries to get access to those folks. And, and, and when you do, it becomes difficult to, to move around after. <coughs> To, to move around after that. But you know, the reality is, is it wasn't long after I first ventured to Iran in 2004 that I found a much more interesting opposition, which is the 60% of those parts of the, the, the world that are under the age of 30, that are the most similar to us, that are the most accessible, that are the most impressionable, and that are going to be the ones who shape the future of their societies. You spend about half of the book on Iran, and uh, you make the point, which might strike a lot of people as, uh, as quite a bold claim, that they are among the most pro-American people in the world. How can you justify something like that? Well, I, I think a lot of, uh, you know, first of all, Iran is an extremely young country demographically. It's 68 million people, and 67 percent of that, that that population is under the age of 30. You know, and, and I very much believe that that on the whole, the young people in Iran are driven by a fundamental principle of we'll love anything our government hates and hate anything our government loves. You know, they have a tremendous affinity for for American culture and and, and, and American people, and then um, you know most Iranians are, are, are you know very frustrated with the economy and the situation that, that its regime ha has brought to it. They want interaction with Americans. They want interaction with people outside. They want opportunities. They don't want their press censored. They, they don't want their internet censored. You know, these are kids that want opportunities just like young people all around the world. And, and, and you know, they want to connect with Americans just like they want to connect with each other and other young people around the world. What is it, do you think, that unites all these young people insofar as they do have this affinity with the emblems of American capitalism, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, uh, the flash cars, the cell phones, the uh, satellite TV, those kinds of things. W what is it about American culture, do you think, that excites them? Well, Richard, I, I would actually look at it in, in a slightly different way. I would say, what is it about youth culture that, 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 that binds all these people together? It's, it's, it, these things that we describe, they're not American phenomenon. A lot of them began in the United States, but these are things that, that, are, that are relevant to, to young people, not any particular society. I always say that the largest party in every single country, it's not a political party, it's not a religious group, it's a demographic, metaphorical youth party. It doesn't necessarily know that it exists, but when you interact with young people in these societies, when I would go to young people, whether they were extremist or moderate, secular or non-secular, political or apolitical, part of a militant group or, or, or a peaceful law-abiding citizen, and I related to them as a youth. That is, talk to them about music, talk to them about sports, talk to them about what they want to be when they grow up, how frustrating it is when our parents tell us to, to do things we don't want to do, the, the sort of nature of rebelling against uh, authority figures. I mean, these are all things that we can, we can relate on as, as young people. And, and you know, to, to sort of suggest that it's just an American phenomenon is to neglect the fact that there is this global youth identity that exists. And I don't say that because young people all around the world enjoy some of the same products and some of the same music, that that means they're going to love uh, the different policies of different governments. But what I say is that because that similarity exists across youth culture, because young people are the lowest common denominator, that's our avenue for engagement. That's our channel for our engagement. Young people in these societies are extremely accessible. With the, the technology boom, they're, they're extremely reachable. They're, they're, they're open and willing to, to, to interact with other people, and, the, and, and, and they're craving knowledge. They're craving alternative in the absence of, of, of education, uh, educational opportunities on the one hand and social recreational opportunities on the other. But, but it's quite extraordinary uh, to, to pick out, as you did, Hezbollah activists who you met regularly in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And you talk about people driving for hours to go to a, a mm -hmm. Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> uh, it seems that that kind of, uh, of that, that sort of a, approach to the world has overcome many of the ways in which they were brought up. 
Well, I, it's really interesting about young people, especially the ones that are that I met that are affiliated with Hezbollah or affiliated with Hamas and and other groups. You know, young people live two lives, just like they do in 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 uh, in, in, in most countries. They live one life in, in in front of their authority figures, be it their parents or their governments, and then they live another life behind closed doors. There, there's two chapters in in Children of Jihad that really talk about this. One is called Democracy After Dark. And it, it, it focuses on Iran, but it talks about how once the sun goes down in Iran and kids are behind closed doors or in dark alleyways, that you feel more like you're at a fraternity party than, than, than you are in an Islamic Republic. And then there's another chapter called The All Night Party of God. I had interviewed these, uh, the, these young members of Hezbollah that, that uh, had described what was going on in, in Beirut's wild and crazy uh, party scene as, as uh, you know, not modest and, and inappropriate. And then you'd catch some of these kids out uh, at night at, at uh, nightclubs tr uh, drinking and trying their luck on, on Christian girls. I mean, it's just, I, I, I tell that example not because that's the case for every member of Hezbollah. In fact, it's probably a, 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 small, mi um, a small minority. But you know, the reality is, is, at the end of the day, young people have a youth identity. Young people are going to rebel. And even the young members of Hezbollah that I met, they were not immune from this youth identity, which is still kind of innately in, in, in their personality. And how important is the digital age in, in providing cohesion for, for the young people of, of the Middle East? as in the rest of the world. Well, I mentioned before that the similarities across youth culture is, is, is our opening. Um, the digital age is our opportunity. You know, young people around the world have been similar for, for, for decades and decades since the beginning of time. What makes this particular moment unique is that this is the very first generation socialized into societies with high prevalence of satellite TV, mobile phones, and internet. And their parents weren't digital natives like these kids are. So these kids are using the same technologies as the adults, but they're using them in completely different ways and for completely different purposes. So this actually makes their networks of communication different. They don't use the technology so much to get information as much as to basically create alternatives alternatives and spaces for interactions and, and basic freedoms that they don't necessarily have in their societies. This is the most emancipated group of young people that we've ever seen in our lifetime because for the first time they don't need other people to provide alternatives for them. The digital uh, opening that's provided to them gives them a space to create alternatives for themselves. And does religion play as big a part in their lives as it did for their parents? And I know it's really impossible to, to generalize mm -hmm. about this, but if you sort of meet as you did the people on the streets of these <coughs> various countries in the Middle least. Did you find that religion was shaping their lives in the way that it would have shaped their parents? Um, again, I think this is where the, the, the technology boom comes in. You know, young people are able to do things in secret. They're able to create their own alternatives. They're able to be anyone and say anything they want as they operate above the grid, not just at the police state apparatuses, but also uh, away, away from their parents. And so I think young people have more privacy now than they did before because of that digital space. They have uh, a, a space that diverts them away from uh, you know, the, the values that their parents are trying to impose on them, the values that their regimes are trying to impose on them. And then every kid you know, decides for themselves how, how religious they are. Because I don't believe anybody becomes a terrorist or a militant because they're deeply pious in, in one religion or another. Nobody's born wanting to be a militant. You know, kids join extremist groups because they're humiliated, which leads to alienation. And extremists that have hijacked an otherwise peaceful religion, Islam, are using a religion or exploiting a religion as a club to offer membership to humiliated and alienated individuals. There's a chapter in Children of Jihad called Struggling for Dignity about the Palestinians where I describe the young Palestinian militants I met not as, as gun-toting mass militants shouting Allahu Akbar, but as broken souls with dangerous toys who would rather have a pen in their hand. But a pen isn't going to give them an opportunity or status. We look at the Middle East right now, we look at the media, it looks like it's, it's, it's filled with turmoil, it looks like it's filled with challenges, and don't get me wrong, it, there, there's a tremendous number of challenges there, but the reason I remain optimistic, and the reason the tone of my book is optimistic, is because I look at the 60% of that part of the world that's under the age of 30, and I see this demographic window that isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to last forever, because these kids are going to be the adults soon, and then I look at the digital age, and I think this is the very first time that Everyone from education institutions to governments to the private sector to just young kids in their dorm rooms at universities and kids at secondary schools can actually have a stake in this. You know, young people have the ability to engage now across societies without needing a visa, without needing money, and without needing their parents' permission to travel to these different societies. Now you are with the State Department, part of the policy planning team. What do you think the U.S. government should be doing what direction should they be going in to tap into what you believe is this, this potential for good? Well, again, I, I go back to the fact that governments are only one of, of, of many stakeholders in this. I mean, we, again, with the digital age, you know, the number of stakeholders has only increased. I, I believe that average citizens have, have a role to play. Um, and, and if you don't like the direction uh, that you feel the world is going in, if you think people have misperceptions about America, or likewise, if 
you think you have, if you have certain misperceptions about different parts of the world, you can actually do something about it. So we need empowerment of entire societies. I mean, misperceptions are the products of societies themselves. And after 9-11, let's be honest, misperceptions developed all around the world of, of, of different societies.